Uh, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the last panel session. Um, so it's an honor and a pleasure for me to introduce our two panel speakers this, uh, for this last session. Uh, I actually know both of them uh, personally and well. I first met Dr. In Sung Jong when uh, she was uh, interested in what we were doing here at Yale University College. So Dr. Jung served as a professor of education and language education at the International Christian University, a liberal arts college in Tokyo uh, for 20 years. Uh, she is now a visiting research fellow at the Education Research Institute with international scholars to co-author in, in, in South Korea. And Dr. Jung has collaborated with international scholars to co-author and edit several publications. She also founded the Global Research Network for liberal arts education and serves as an editor for a Springer book series uh, on liberal arts education. She has also served as a consultant and advisor to numerous national and international institutions, including the Korean Ministry of Education, UNESCO, the World Bank, and uh, APEC. So this afternoon, she will share with us her views on revitalizing liberal arts education while balancing tradition and innovation in a globalized Asian context. Our second speaker this afternoon is another dear friend, uh, Professor Naoko Shimatsu. Uh, she taught history uh, here at Yale and US College uh, between 2016 and 2023, and is currently at Tokyo College uh, International Institute of Advanced Study uh, at the University of Tokyo. Prior to coming to join us at Yale and US College, she taught at Birkbeck College, uh, University of London, uh, for 20 years. She's authored several books uh, as a global historian uh, of Asia and has worked extensively uh, on Japan. Her work has strong interdisciplinary foundations. Uh, she explores how history and historical methods can converse meaningfully, not only with uh, cognate disciplines in the social sciences and humanities, but also with the sciences, engineering, medicine, and creative arts. Uh, she believes that we need to go out of our comfort zones to engage with new thinking uh, and to engender new conversations uh, through radical interdisciplinarity. So definitely what we were trying to do here at uh, Yale and US College, and uh, she also has been involved with experiential learning, what was mentioned earlier about labs, which was learning across boundaries, or our week seven uh, projects, which uh, I think I can confidently say all our students loved and learned a lot from. And so uh, uh, Professor Naoko will uh, cover experiential learning and interdisciplinary research based on her teaching experiences uh, at Yale and US College uh, later. But first, I'd like to invite Dr. Jung to come and share uh, her talk. Thank you very much, first of all, for the organizers of this event uh, to invite me to uh, this very meaningful, actually for me, it's a learning experience. Uh, I, I, become to, I, I knew uh, Yale NUS College, but then I didn't know the details, how, how you have engaged in uh, establishing uh, this university. I, I think it will be great that uh, around, uh, not just uh, the, those knowledge and experience stays here, but also, you know, uh, share with uh, other parts of the world. Thank you. My talk, this? Okay, I, here I was going to introduce myself, but then thank you, uh, Ku. Um, so I will skip this, and then I will go to uh, my agendas. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, traditional models, which means well-established, uh, commonly widely used models in liberal arts education, especially focusing on Asia. Uh, but then I, I think most of these models are also common in other parts of the world. Another one is more innovative approaches that we have seen uh, over the past uh, few years. And then I will make uh, a few of my suggestions. But before I go further, 
There are some terminology issues in liberal arts education, which is most popular. But in some parts, uh, some, um, some countries, they use liberal studies or humanities. Or liberal education, especially in the, uh, in the US, they use liberal education. And now they begin to use liberal learning, learning uh, focusing on uh, learner side. The, the result, outcome of liberal education. Another one is liberal arts and science education, which I think is used uh, in European countries, uh, several European uh, countries, including Netherlands and some other countries. And general ed education is uh, quite uh, popular, especially liberal education provided within the large uh, research comprehensive universities in Asia. Okay, so traditional ones, um, they are more toward uh, well-rounded education, whole person education. Uh, and then the uh, liberal arts program, general education, is mostly a preparatory curriculum for majors. Uh, just imagine a regular comprehensive university, big universities, and they do have like two year for uh, first year and then second year, they will have some required uh, requirements. The students have to go through, uh, have to take uh, some courses, uh, distribution requirement. But there are some, in Asia, there are some dedicated uh, liberal arts colleges uh, in Singapore. This is the only one, I guess. And then, but then most of the um, big universities, they do have uh, liberal arts colleges or liberal arts programs or faculty of liberal studies. So for example, Korea, only one liberal art, dedicated liberal arts college, Handong Global University. It's not, it's not in Seoul, it's in uh, uh, southern part of Korea. And but many, uh, most, I think, all of the Korean uh, large universities, they do have uh, liberal arts uh, faculty program. And uh, the Seoul National University is trying to uh, extend the liberal arts program, which is not going well. I, I think uh, uh, some, there are some different ideas and many people think this is waste of their time. So <laughs> we are kind of debating and how, how we're gonna solve these issues. Japan, I, as far as I know, Japan has the largest number of liberal arts colleges, at least in, within Asia. I, I see you where I uh, taught. Akita International University is another small uh, liberal arts university, public university, liberal arts college, and then Miyazaki and some other uh, small liberal arts, uh, dedicated liberal arts colleges. And most of the large universities, including Tokyo University, also has liberal arts programs. So liberal arts education is pretty uh, much well accepted within the system, within the system. And China, I think Hong Kong's Lingnan University is only one university they claim their uh, liberal arts college, and others have liberal arts programs. Taiwan, I don't think I know any of the Taiwanese, um, I mean, Taiwan colleges are dedicated liberal arts college. But most of the Taiwanese per, uh, universities have the program. Singapore, uh, you know more than myself. And there is an alliance of Asian liberal arts universities. I am not sure Yale and USC is a part of this uh, alliance. Maybe, yes. So, um, so liberal arts education has been uh, really gaining some um, influence uh, within uh, the Asian context. And so commonalities among these liberal arts programs is to ensure that all their students engage in a wide range of courses uh, to widen their perspective. So it's, it's more like through core, either core curriculum or or and employ the distribution requirement. Distribution requirement is the most popular version, but then they also have some core curriculums. A few, maybe this core curriculum might be a little different from uh, uh, core common, uh, common core here, uh, 
um, but then they have some interdisciplinary style courses as well. And then they adopt, I would say, multidisciplinary rather than interdisciplinary because they divide the work. Uh, you know, uh, this part I will teach and this part you teach. And so it's, it's not really integrated uh, form of education, I mean, the course like uh, Yale's and uh, US uh, core courses. So it's quite. Uh, uh, how, how do you say, team taught class, but not really uh, integrated. Right. So I did uh, some curriculum analysis, core curriculum analysis, uh, what is written requirement, and 15 to 20 percent from humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences are required. Uh, so that students have to take those. Uh, those courses. They emphasize small interactive classes, but then I found many of them are large lecture style courses uh, that students have to go through this requirement. And then they say under the name of uh, general education. General education courses are really big classes because students have to take those classes. Uh, same in our university. We also had a uh, kind of um, uh, some issues, challenges with uh, uh, general education courses. So um, there are some current trend, trend that I like to highlight. One is they try uh, university try to develop more interdisciplinary courses. Uh, for example, Yale, I, I get the Yale one, and ICU has also team taught uh, some special courses they pick and they support. Uh, and then we, uh, faculty members are uh, exempt from teaching roads uh, one week, uh, one one semester, and they developed this uh, general education courses as uh, interdisciplinary ones. And then they op opt for a more practical approach. And there are some um, really good example that I like to share with you is uh, there is an English program for liberal arts. You know, when you teach English to the foreign student or a Japanese student, it's an English course, English program is very practical, right? When, when you learn how to speak, how to write, and the, it's a really good uh, kind of job skills, vocational skills. But our program emphasize not English as an English t uh, language, but they teach some social issues global issues, like climate issues. They bring the issues and the problems, and they um, read those papers, and then discuss it uh, with the student. Students have to, the content itself is a very um, uh, problem-oriented, project-oriented, and the student will work as a small group, and they have to use various technologies. You know, you're using uh, wikis and uh, Google Docs and all uh, social media so that they need to solve these issues using English that they learned in the class. So English program is one of the uh, uh, most popular program in, at ICU. And this is, um, we call it ELA, uh, English for Liberal Arts. So, from here, we can see that pra even practical content can be taught in a liberal arts way. So liberal arts doesn't mean, to me, uh, it's just content. It's, it's more than the content. It's, a, it's the, the pedagogical way of teaching certain content. So, uh, and then create, there is another one is create your own major and or decide the major later. So uh, Seoul National University introduced a system that students can create their own major. So uh, it's a very popular program. Uh, they come here without knowing anything about you know, what kind of disciplines or what kind of uh, paths they can have in the future. But once they become to uh, be exposed to different kind of dif disciplines and the way of solving problems, perspectives, uh, they can form their own major in, in a little later stage. Another, but then the challenge came. We know the rapid decrease in the young population, especially in Korea, birth rate is 0 0.7. 
or even less. <laughs> Japan 1.2, China 1.1 or 2. I'm sure that uh, Singapore is one point something, right? So it become very serious. We don't have enough applicants, right? And then dec that means decrease in funding, and money doesn't come that easily. Technology is advancing so quickly. We have now G uh, ChatGPT and ChatGPT4, which provide us a personalized learning tool. So, you know, there are MOOCs and there are some other things. So we, I mean, and, and their lifelong education is a norm, whereas liberal arts education is focusing like undergraduate mainly. So that's kind of, you know, one, one, one aspect is a lifelong education, but then we have a certain uh, period. And another one is internationalization, transnational higher education. So we, when you think about uh, local, you know, one nation, there are all different kinds of uh, competitors, many competitions. And global university ranking is asking faculty members to publish more, right? Even uh, liberal arts colleges. So I see you faculty members always complain because they don't have enough time. <laughs> But then the, the teaching requirements, you know, not just number of hours of teaching, but the expectation is very high. We cannot just give the lecture. Lecture is the easy part, <laughs> right? So because of these challenges, there are uh, some new um, approaches appearing in liberal arts college. I think one of the most, um, uh, I won't say advanced, but unique uh, model is Korea's, there is one cyber university, Taeje University is taking um, the America's US Minerva model. I'm not sure whether you are familiar with the Minerva model. And they teach most of the content resources online. Uh, but then students have to stay in one place seven different places in this case, uh, in uh, Taeje University, I mean five cities, globally having an experiential learning. While they are together with other students, they don't actually listen to teachers. With teachers, they uh, interact through the system platform. They, uh, Taeje bought a platform from Minerva. It's a uh, Engal, how, how do you pronounce? Engage, engagely, engagely. <laughs> this one, this one is the main platform, like a Moodle. And then there is another one, Metaverse. They, they combine with Metaverse and there is a digital library as well. So all technology enhanced teaching and learning environment, it makes uh, engagingly <laughs> Metaverse make it easy for students and teachers to interact. It's not like common uh, Moodle style, you know, giving away style uh, platform. So they use this. But then what, what they do is uh, during their face-to-face -face time, they do experiential learning, which means they will meet people. For example, Teje students um, uh, not, right now staying in Seoul, they will visit uh, Samsung. And then they, of course, they have some kind of problems. I mean, problem situation case, or they have to solve. And then they interview people from Samsung, and then they observe, and then they ask some questions. So they are learning by observing, talking with some expert, and then they, they leave there for, uh, for one term, one semester, one year, depending on the where they are. They are. So they, they are right now in Seoul, but then they will go to Hong Kong, New York, Tokyo, and Moscow during four years. Minerva also takes a similar approach. Um, so, and then they, their focus is not the, uh, it's not the you know, regular disciplines. They focus on six competencies which means core, uh, core curriculum that Yale and U.S. has is, is 
is not just those classes. It's across all the courses for four years. So, so I was able to uh, listen to one student who graduated from Minerva University, Minerva University, and then he came to. Um, uh, he was employed by uh, Seoul National University. So he was saying, when I was studying at Minerva University, I didn't like it because there there was no structure. You know, if I take uh, uh, economics 101, then I have to learn this, this, this. He was Im imagining that kind of structured, well-organized learning at the university. There was nothing like that. But then after the graduation, he came to uh, Seoul National University. He got re everyone wants, wants him to be in their teams because he was a, such a good problem solver. He was able to solve most of the problems, not because he knows the content, but because he knows how to do it. That's what he has been trained. So a very critical uh, thinker and coming up with uh, new ideas. And so, so this, uh, the person that interviewed him was really impressed by, by the result. I mean, he, I don't think he remembers any of the details, but, but, you know, when there is a problem, always a problem in the universities, right? So he was able to support uh, the university to solve that problem with uh, his skills because of this competency, uh, com more competency-based uh, learning at the River Art College. So digital education combined technology enhanced uh, liberal learning is one innovative approach. Another approach is the integration of the learning. I think you are already, some, some of the universities are already doing it. Uh, those, uh, they, they focus on skills, I mean the skills, develop skills that are essential for life, citizenship, and work, and they integrate learning, which means they integrate academic learning and practical learning and vocational learning. Not just academic learning, but also practical and vocational learning. And they also uh, integrate academic and experiential or real world learning as well. So that internship is not the extracurricular or practicum or community-based service learning used to be or still uh, the extracurriculum activity that are not really considered as a liberal arts core, but now they try to integrate uh, those experiential real world vocational learning into the academic curriculum. So that's one uh, example. Another one that I see is important uh, innovation is outcome-based, competency-based education. When we talk about liberal, okay, one minute? All right. <laughs> liberal arts education, many cases they talk about humanities, what to teach, which is not actually, I mean, we are over the stage, but many people think, oh, liberal arts education, oh, they teach humanities and this. It's not about what we teach. What you study is about the result. I think we have to look at the result. What are the results of our students going through this liberal arts way of learning or teaching. So outcome-based education is becoming uh, kind of ex experimenting. Some uh, universities are experimenting this outcome-based uh, education. Uh, ICU is using OECD's rubric for creative and critical thinking. We claim that we are teaching you know, courses to improve, enhance critical thinking and then creative thinking. But uh, our students really critical, how do you know? So there, there is a, some rubric which can help uh, educators to evaluate, to assess 
the, uh, my teaching, the outcome of my teaching. I think this will be a good example. So based on that, I made uh, a few uh, suggestions. One is maybe we need to go back to the liberal arts education, the concept, and redefine it or enhance uh, the, the concept. It's, I, I, I don't see liberal arts is opposite of vocational or practical education. It's itself is a real world competencies. Um, the outcome of liberal arts education is real world competencies. When we look at the critical creative communication skills, all are really important, you know, real world skills, right? It's very, very practical. And then um, focusing on not just college students, you know, the, of, of those four years. Why not expanding, you know, it could be a lifetime, lifelong education, lifelong uh, liberal education for all. Because it's such an important skills that we are really um, enhance, uh, enhancing our students. Another one is that, um, so the creative, personalized, interactive, interconnected learning with the help of uh, technology. So, uh, and then the final one will be the use um, essential outcome-based learning, uh, learning objectives. Maybe we wanna review our, um, our syllabus maybe at the faculty level, whether we really have uh, have achieved uh, our learning outcomes, liberal learning outcomes. Oh, this is really final, <laughs> sorry. And then I, I think as uh, Chris mentioned, I think, and then some other uh, speakers mentioned, space is really important. Uh, space meaning physical space, physical virtual space. So like within the university, maybe formal, informal learning spaces, technology rich spaces, virtual spaces, collaborative self-study zones, creative commons, and even the dormitory, how you design the dormitory will affect student uh, liberal arts learning as well. So, sorry, it took uh, quite a bit. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Jung, for your presentation. I would now like to invite our second presenter for this fourth panel, Professor Naoko Shimazu, Head of Research Faculty at International Institute of Advanced Study in Tokyo University. Professor Shimazu, please. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I can't quite see because I've got reading glasses, so I can't really see all the faces, but very nice to see you. Uh, those of you who, who, um, who know me from Yale NUS days, only a few months ago. And, um, and a big welcome to those who are um, new to the place and who are, whom I haven't met. Um, so it's a great pleasure for me to be asked to, um, uh, to be invited and to, um, to give a talk about experiential learning. Um, and interdisciplinarity at Yale and US. Um, perhaps if I could just explain to you a bit, of my, a bit about my background, then you will understand that my seven years at Yale and US College was actually really about experiential learning for me. Um, so in some sense, this title has a double entendre that it is actually, I'm gonna talk about experiential learning that I experienced myself for the students. So I, um, it may be that because I, I moved to the University of Tokyo and I'm at an institute for advanced study and we don't have any undergraduates, it's just research. And so these seven years might have been the only period in my life where I actually did have the uh, privilege of teaching at, at a liberal arts college. And before that, I was at Birkbeck College, Uni University of London for 20 years. And um, it was, um, although it's called Birk, I think everywhere I go, it's something college. <laughs> Birkbeck College, yeah, and US College, and now Tokyo College. And they all have different meanings, this term college. Um, at Birkbeck, it was a, um, sort of like a, 
sort of standard university with uh, undergraduate, masters, PhD programs. And here is just liberal arts, and at Tokyo it's just research. So I had never actually been to a liberal arts environment, and I had never really realized the extent of the difference in education that one gets if one were at a liberal arts college instead of uh, a state, a state university or state college that I've been con um, involved with almost all my life, except for the seven years here. So um, I'm going to talk in particular about, um, uh, I've actually done, so as you can imagine, coming from that kind of background, this was one of the most exciting things for me to do when I came to Yale NUS College. I really wanted to do things that I just simply could not do in UK. And so I took, you know, took to this experiential learning uh, and I visited Trisha Craig at SAIP probably too often and, um, and was so eager to come up with ideas for, um, for designing some of these experiences. So I'm just going to talk about two of those because I did a number of them. And um, the first one is, uh, which took place in 2017 and 2018. Um, before I got too busy with uh, college um, ad admin roles. Um, so, first of all, I had never realized that at the liberal arts college kind of environment, you have this thing called the equivalent of site, Center for International and Professional Experience, because these things simply do not exist at state universities in the UK, and also like I was in Canada before, and it's, it just didn't exist in the 80s um, and 90s. And so I was astonished by the amount of resources available to make things happen for students. And it was all about students when I came here. And that also really surprised me because in, in the UK in particular, it's not actually all about students. And so this kind of change of um, uh, sort of trajectory and, and the framework in which I was going to operate here uh, was something that I kind of had to get used to. And, um, and, but also it gave me, as I said, these amazing opportunities. Now, um, I, I think these experiences I'm going to explain to you in some detail, uh, because I am actually interested in the process of doing things or making things happen. Um, and I think it's through the process that you learn, um, because that is such an important part of the experience itself. And so I'm going to explain to you all these things, but in all, what I realized was, wow, this experiential learning can be so important and positive. And um, I felt really sorry for the students in the UK who just never would have had this kind of experiences. So that is something that really sticks in my mind, the availability of resources. And I think we talked about this earlier in the day and yesterday with Marshall Grant's talk, that it is actually this thing about like, is there enough resources to actually um, structure, design, and people these um, parts of the college um, administration and, um, and life in general. Now, the first one that I'm going to talk about is this cultural heritage as sustainable development. And this is a beautiful palace uh, called the Mariga Taiwan Palace in uh, Cham, Thailand. And Cham is very close to Hua Hin. It's just before Hua Hin towards Bangkok. And I hope Brian's here. Brian, yes! <laughs> so Brian was part of the team that, um, that helped to make this happen. And I, I think it's really important to say that the thing that was very striking about this place for me was this teamwork, both at the um, student level and at the faculty level. That was a striking feature of this place. And the students here just took to teamwork, group work, just like so naturally and so engagingly and so kind of interested, excitedly, that I couldn't believe my eyes because I had problems in the UK when I tried to put students in small group discussions. And they would say, Nako, why do I have to talk to these people? 
you know, I came to learn and I don't want to talk to them. So this concept of peer learning was something that I really had to learn here because there just wasn't enough of this peer learning. And I myself, coming from that kind of background, wasn't at all convinced that peer learning was going to work. You know, because I kind of firmly came from this very old-fashioned idea that learning was in this structured environment with, with the teacher and the students. But here, it actually peer learning in, in some sense works even better <laughs> than this kind of hierarchical learning. So that was an incredibly important thing that I learned. Um, and I think that must be, must be the general strength of liberal arts colleges, um, not just here, but everywhere else. Now, this um, internship that um, Chusha Craig and Saip and I, uh, together with the palace director, um, Klauma Ipinsoy, uh, created, took place for eight weeks. So it was a very long internship program. It was a brand new thing that was created out of scratch. And um, it, uh, like I would say, almost all the programs I got involved here actually had something to do with my personal connection with the partner institution because I actually knew Klama Dipinsoy very, very well. And um, so I, uh, when I came to Singapore, the first thing I did in the first month was actually to visit her and see if there were any possibilities for this kind of um, um, collaboration. And she was very keen, so I came back hurriedly and knocked on Trisha's door and said, Trisha, you know, could we do something about this? And this is, in a way, how it all started. And it took an incredible amount of planning, a really intense planning. And this is, what, this is basically a big part of what I learned, which is how do you essentially set up a project management project, uh, project management project, and a project management um, thing uh, for the students. And so I, was, I must say, Trisha, I was just amazed by your knowledge and what we had to do. So I was learning that, gosh, this is what you have to do. So it's a bit like being in the United Nations Development Program or something, and you kind of think, okay, you're in charge of this project, you know, create it and do it. And so in that sense, we created this project together, although Trisha was my teacher in this thing. and. Um, and what we kind of tried to do was we, we tried to develop uh, this project with two objectives in mind. Uh, the first was to create a work and learning opportunity that would help students make use of their skills and knowledge gained through the interdisciplinary education they were getting here. Um, and how you apply the skill sets that you learned here to real life situation. So this was sort of like, put, put your skills that you think you learned, put it into practice at this palace museum. Um, and then um, the second important thing that we were bearing in mind was the fact that we wanted to do something sort of quite substantial in Asia. And so we had to find an institution. And of course, um, uh, this director, who is obviously a friend of mine, is an incredibly dynamic person who actually started this sort of like an arts movement in the 1990s. And she was quite pivotal in, um, in contemporary arts uh, movements. She, not as an artist, but like as a curator, as a director, as sort of like somebody who makes things happen. So she was an ideal partner for us to work on. And also, the palace director told us that uh, she wanted to collaborate with us for two reasons. One was that the palace um, wanted to create a stronger integrated history of the environment, culture, and architecture, and put it into one narrative. And then the second um, uh, objective she had was to strengthen the educational role that the palace already had, but wasn't strong enough. So how can we make, help them to make this dimension of palace's existence even more prominent? And therefore, um, palace, as, palace Museum as an educational establishment, rather than just somewhere that you went on a Sunday for a stroll, which was actually happening. And they had an enormous amount of visitors, unbelievable amount, um, for a place which was quite out of the way, 
And um, we, we, we tried to figure out why that was the case, but mainly because there wasn't many other sites around <laughs> that people actually went. And it was, it's a beautiful, beautiful um, structure right by the sea, which obviously helped. So anyway, uh, as project managers, I pretended to be a project manager with Trisha, and we focused on creating this framework that addressed two existing gaps um, uh, faced by the palace. So one is between the actual and ideal visitor experience, and then the second was the organizational structure of the palace, uh, sort of designed as a tourist destination, but it wanting to transform itself more as an education educational center, you know, have a strong educational role. So this is the kind of thing I had to learn, which is that you had to think of the tasks necessary in order to make things happen, and then you match it with skills. And um, so we spent quite a lot of time trying to think of what are the things which are necessary in order to make this project happen, um, and what are the things we had to have, what are we gonna do in this project. Um, and so there were quite a lot of meetings and um, thrashing out ideas, brainstorming, uh, so on going on. And then we came up with these skill sets. And then what happened is um, we recruited, sorry, we recruited the students um, as interns uh, because we wanted them to feel the sense that they weren't just coming on another, you know, week seven. This was a serious internship. Um, and also we encouraged students who um, had different kinds of skills because we wanted a very multidisciplinary team um, that would, so whose skills and knowledge would complement each other, and we encouraged students with language abilities to apply. Now, out of eight places we had, we saved two for Yale students because, because we obviously saw this as an important opportunity for us to strengthen links with Yale. Um, and so in the end, we, um, the team of eight ended up with Singaporeans, Chinese, Thai, Ghanaian, um, and American. So their backgrounds came from social sciences, humanities, environmental studies, environmental science, you know, and so on. So in that sense, it was great. This is the best recruiting ground for this kind of diversity um, if you want to have a multinational team. And then, of course, we had to create a team, an interdisciplinary team of academics and pro professionals. And this is where Brian McAdoo came in as the beachfront, you know, ecology and, um, and so on. And also Robin McAdoo, um, was there as a landscape architect who could actually teach us about how visitor routes can make a difference to the visiting experience of a museum. Uh, we also had a Thai botanist who was a specialist in distinguishing between native species and invasive species on the beach. So we kind of really managed to pinpoint uh, very kind of specialized expertise which the palace needed. And this required quite a lot of um, digging around, contacting people, and so on. Right, so this is, in the end, these are some of the things that, because I, I know we are running out of time, I'm sure, is it right? How many? Five. Five, okay, right. So we ended up creating a new visitor center for the Palace Museum, which actually integrated the, the different strands of the narrative that the palace wanted to have project. So the culture, you know, uh, his, uh, culture, history, environmental, ecology, and, and so on. And this was all basically designed by students and implemented by them. And then this is one of the um, displays that was made in the new uh, route that they created for the Palace Museum in order to maximize exposure to, um, to the environmental concerns that the Palace had. And they actually created this small model of the uh, shoreline. <laughs> it's actually quite amazing that they did it all in eight weeks, but um, anyway, they did. And anyway, they did lots of other things, but um, unfortunately, I'm just not gonna have time to um, time to explain them or uh, describe them all to you. But essentially, at the end of the day, they, we, we made them write a final report. And the palace director said, well, she wanted the students to present the final report to the management board of the palace. 
<laughs> so this rather kind of formal occasion took place. And um, this is the report that they created. And of course, because the student team, the interns, actually had lots of different kinds of expertise. Some of them had incredible kind of um, uh, visual uh, knowledge and, you know, putting together these um, uh, these sort of, you know, different elements together into this beautiful report, and they presented it to the board. Now, the board was flabbergasted <laughs> because, <laughs> because of the amount of effort uh, that, uh, that was put in both by us, but all, particularly by the students, because they're not actually seeing very much of us doing the work. So the students put, and, and also the output, um, um, by the students, and even more so about the underlying ethos which Trisha and I were trying to um, impart, which was to, um, to kind of give the sense of ownership of this project to the students or the interns and guide them to solve problems um, and come up with their own solutions when they hit difficulties because we kind of really wanted them to themselves to be consultants and what would they do if they were actually facing these situations in real life situation, which actually this was. Um, so what, um, what the Thai, the board and the other faculty which, uh, who had been invited to, to come to this um, final presentation day, what they actually said was that they simply could not believe the level of agency students exercised in doing this project management. Um, and because they said this simply would not have been possible if it had been a Thai project, you know, organized by a Thai university and so on. So in that sense, um, you know, you, you kind of part of the thing that you, you hope would have happened is actually that this could work as some kind of model for this kind of project, um, student-led um, project management uh, in future for, for the Thai universities. But, we, I mean, because of the cost involved in organizing this, because we had um, funding from Luce Foundation, uh, which was wonderful, and also the palace actually funded some of the um, costs too, that it was just too expensive. So in that sense, it was actually sort of, um, I don't know, I, I kind of felt a bit disappointed <laughs> because I thought it would have been great if we could have provided a model which they could also adopt in some way or try to do something like that. Um, but maybe this was sort of a bit too, I don't know, too amazing in a way, do you see what I mean? In the scale of things uh, might have been um, really quite um, beyond what they might have been able to imagine. Now, these are some of the student reflections. Um, so this urban uh, studies major said, the palace um, brought to light not only the importance of conserving environmental and ecological heritage, but also how the three strands of heritage, i.e. environmental, architecture, and cultural, are so deeply connected where the deterioration of one could potentially impact the other strands uh, negatively. And then another student, Arts and Hunts major, said, this is the first consultant, as a first time consultant, this internship has challenged me in a multitude of ways, was truly thought inspiring to be able to communicate with other interns from different academic disciplines and witness the integration of our ideas during this internship. Um, so, <laughs> this is the lovely group of students um, I, uh, we, we went up with. Um, so, so in, 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 in the general sense, I would say that um, I think Trisha and I and Saip and also um, the palace director felt that this was a proof of concept, in a way, structuring interdisciplinary internship into work experience for students in the liberal arts. Um, experiential learning initiatives such as this project help students to develop um, the applied form of skills that they learned through liberal arts education here. On the other hand, as I said, um, I, I did kind of wonder how we could actually make things more kind of um, maybe scaled down a bit uh, so that it could really work as a model 
for, um, for universities in Thailand or somewhere in Southeast Asia, because um, in, in a way, we, we, we really are trying to position ourselves in Southeast Asia and situate us as one of the Southeast Asian states. So, of course, Singapore <laughs> kind of is the richest state kind of thing. So this has that uh, implication, but I think it's very important to be um, part of the, um, the landscape of Southeast Asia in, in terms of education. But also, um, another thing is the importance of resources to be able to do this thing. And so I think one of the big takeaways for me was how can we translate or at least like try to make parts of what we did for this project possible for at a much broader level, you know, wider level in university education because it, it is such an important dimension, I thought, um, that that we 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 perhaps should be working more on. And I know I've run out of time totally, so I cannot tell you my second project. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, I'm so sorry, um, because that one is a very different kind of project. <laughs> it was one of the learning across boundaries uh, that I did for one week with uh, the University of Zurich's Global History Seminar. And what we did was we just, we brought, uh, you know, was it eight, no, 10 students from here, uh, including two from Yale, and we kind of matched them with 10 students from uh, Zurich History of Department. And my colleague friend, who is Professor Martin Dusenberry there, he and I created, well actually he did, administrative, created a block seminar especially to make this happen. So that was quite exciting and a very different kind of project altogether because it was much more sort of intellectually, academically based. Um, but it did have um, quite a bit of interdisciplinary element. And also it was about how do you integrate two groups, different groups of students um, studying in very different contexts and bring them together and have a very meaningful interaction uh, in a very short set of time, which is like a week. Um, but anyway, I can answer that in Q&A if somebody wants to ask. So thank you very much indeed.